What do you want to be when you grow up? That is a question that all of us have faced at some moment when we were children. Our parents, our friends, our friends' parents, they all wanted to know, what are we thinking about the future? And you might have said, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a politician. I want to be a policeman. So many different activities. However, we forget one thing, that the only thing that is constant is change. So today, thanks to technology, thanks to science, the progress there, we know that many of these roles are no longer valid. There are so many new roles coming up thanks to this advancement. Some of them, for instance, something that we never thought about. Did you ever dream of becoming a big data analyst? What about, do you think about becoming a search engine optimization assistant? So many new roles that were created by technology. So I stopped asking this question to my children. Instead, I encouraged them to think, putting themselves in the shoes of great innovators, great inventors, like the Wright brothers, like Bill Gates, like Chang Yiming, like Elon Musk. People who actually created whole industries and in the process develop a new range of new jobs. So there is not a typical role in the past. They are actually creating, helping to change the future, to mold the future. And that's what we expect today. The 2010s were a decade with so many advances. 4G brought us many new platforms. Today's activities are mostly performed online. A lot of things that we used to do in the past in a physical way, now everything happens to be online, thanks to the progress of technology. That happened in just one decade. So of course, if we think about the future, there are gonna be new challenges and new opportunities. Data is growing exponentially. Every couple of years, the data that we create, companies, individuals, doubles. Creating, of course, challenges for companies managing that data. That being said, more and more users are engaging on the internet, in technology. So therefore, they are creating more and more data. At the same time, devices. There are many new devices that are coming up. Not only computers, not only cell phones. In the future, we'll see IoT devices all over, sensors, and therefore, it will also create a landslide of more data. So all of this has to be managed. We need to find insights in this onslaught of data. And that is a challenge. It is a challenge. Now 5G, it's gonna make it even further. So the data, the amount that we are creating is gonna explode with 5G. Now 5G, of course, it's a revolution that came about when we started using cell phones. And that only happened to be in the 80s. Back in the 70s, AT&T Bell Labs, they were the ones who defined the technology for cell phones. And at some moment, they were asking themselves, how many devices do you think we're gonna sell for cell phones? And of course, at that moment, any management, self-respecting management would go to McKinsey to ask them, could you please predict how many devices you think we'll have in the market? And uh, McKinsey did a study, the company I used to work for, and they came up with a number, 900,000 devices. at and thought, this is not really a big number. And guess what? It was less than one hundredth of the demand that happened to be in the U.S. So 100 million devices now are in the U.S and McKinsey only captured 1% of that potential. That was before. Today, there are almost 10 billion cell phone connections in the world. There are more than 5 billion users with cell phone technology. And even more so, only in three years, 
by 2025, 1.3 billion 5G connections. That's an opportunity, but it's also a challenge for us to think how we can manage this complexity. It's giving us access to new opportunities. Think about a person with Parkinson's disease, a very severe mental disease. A person who didn't happen to be close to a metropolitan area didn't have a chance to have, let's say, surgery. Today, thanks to 5G, it is possible for this person to have remote surgery. And a few months ago, doctors in Sanya were able to operate a person in Beijing using 5G. How is that possible? 5G reduces latency to two milliseconds, making almost instantaneously the performance of the doctors on the patient, even though the distance was almost 1,900 miles away. That is a miracle, but now it's gonna be possible thanks to 5G. It was only in 2019 when 5G was finally deployed. Of course, it was an evolution over many years, and I'm sure many companies today focus on this technology are now thinking about the potential of 6G, 7G, and so on. And that is the beauty of technology, because this technology never stops. We can always think about applications. Back in 2010, when 4G was deployed, we didn't think that today we will have so many new applications that are actually leveraging this potential. And that's also what is gonna happen with technology in this new decade. Because we might think that some applications are relevant, will be the top applications for this technology, but there might be something new. We think about these major companies, Bydance, Tencent, Microsoft, Didi. And you think that these companies actually had a clear idea on the future. Guess what? These companies started in garages when people, two, three people, were part of an initial team, and they came out with some idea. Eventually, they more and more became successful. So today, in Haidian, in Silicon Valley, in Tel Aviv, also teams like that are working on the technologies of the future. We might not know today what is going to be the winning company of the future, but we have to be alert, thanks to the trends that we are reviewing today. 5G creates a lot of information. Many sensors will be available, so cameras, sensors will capture pretty much everything. And that will create also opportunities for artificial intelligence. When you think about AI, artificial intelligence, we think about data. And to make sure that AI works better, we need data. The more data, our models will be more precise. And that will be facilitated by 5G creating the data that AI will need. So to make sure that we improve our 5G models, to make sure that in the future, automobiles can drive themselves, are there no, no fatalities? We need to improve those models. And that's gonna happen thanks to the deployment of 5G. We hear about Bitcoin. We hear about cryptocurrencies. And I think at the end of the day, the excitement about Bitcoin is gonna pass. Do you remember the tulip craze in the 1700s in Netherlands? Back in the day, people were able to buy houses with one single tulip flower because people thought this is gonna be so valuable and the value is gonna stay permanently. That didn't happen. It was the first bubble. And I am confident that Bitcoin is also gonna follow the same path. Instead, we have to look at the underlying technology. And blockchain, indeed, it's a technology that is giving us an opportunity to bring transformation in different industries, financial services, logistics, healthcare, and so on. So that is a technology that we need to focus on, not so much on Bitcoin or many of the cryptocurrencies that are emerging. Some of these cryptocurrencies, though, provide applications opportunities, like Ethereum, where you can create applications and that's something that is gonna change, for example, financial services. If you want to send money from one country to another country in a different currency, it will take some time. It will take days. 
and we will need to pay probably a 2% fee for that, when really the cost for the banks is not that high. It's probably only 1 20th of that. That's an inefficiency that can be addressed using blockchain. And that is something that is going to be beneficial, not only for companies, but also for us individuals, for all of us. In that process, many central banks have implemented central bank digital currencies, which I think is a great idea. At the end of the day, we all struggle to manage physical cash. The idea would be eventually to deploy virtual currencies in the same way that some countries like China, Sweden, Uruguay have already started implementing through pilots. Only a few months ago, people in Beijing and in also different cities received virtual RMB, and they were able to deploy that in the same way that they use money in other e-money platforms. That's something that is going to stay. That is a real application, because now the government will have the opportunity to provide additional tools to monetary policy, for example, providing remittances to the population in some cases. So therefore, that's an additional tool, an additional benefit, thanks to a technology behind underlying Bitcoin. Bitcoin might be a bubble, but the technology there will be productive. In the same way that we deploy technology, now we also think about a convergence of man and machine. Back in the day, even in the 1960s, Jersey Lake Leiter, a computing pioneer, came out with a concept that at some moment, people and computers will be connected. People will become more productive thanks to that cooperation with computers. And computers also will eventually become more and more personable thanks to this cooperation. And of course, we will create these brain-computer interfaces, which have existed already for a few decades. So when you think about these type of interfaces, we actually are able to detect signals in our brains. Our brains have neurons, synapses. If a computer is able to detect some of these signals and then transfer this signal to software or hardware, a person with paralysis, for example, in the limbs, would be able to control a mouse in a computer. So therefore, being able to do some of the operations that all of us can manage easily. That is an advancement. That is an opportunity to provide a real benefit to people who are suffering today, who are not able to interact, to take advantage of the benefits of society as most people. This is the happy face of my son. And as you can see, he has a dream. His dream is, I want to fly like an eagle. And I tell him many times, we are not designed to do that. And then he still remains sad. However, that dream eventually will come true. Because now we need to think about exoskeletons. If you think about an insect, the insect, for example, is able to fly because of this external skeleton that actually provides the facility for the insect to coordinate different parts of the body. That's already in development. So today, people who are hand now are able to use these type of skeletons to be able to walk. People are able to start walking, learning to walk, thanks to these type of supports. And that's relevant. That's something that we can think about expanding, not only to people who are disabled, but also to people who want to carry things that are so heavy, and they would be able to do so, thanks to exoskeletons another area where technology is moving very fast. This device has semiconductors, cell phones, computers. Any type of device today displays semiconductors. And now they are becoming essential to our lives. All of us would need, wouldn't even dream about life today if we didn't have semiconductors. Of course, this is not something new. They were invented back early in the 1930s, and now we are all seeing the deployment of these technologies in all devices. So now they are essential for our lives. However, you might have heard that a few years ago, a couple of years ago, many of major organizations faced shortages of semiconductors. In particular, the automobile industry. Companies, major companies in this industry were not able to provide semiconductors for the vehicles they are producing. And today, 
They produce, of course, traditional vehicles, but also electric vehicles. And these vehicles in particular use many more semiconductors than traditional vehicles for everything. Infotainment, brakes, powertrain, and so on. So a traditional vehicle might use $80 of semiconductors, an electric vehicle will use $600 of semiconductors. So you can only imagine what happened when two years ago, COVID emerged. People couldn't go to work, so plants stopped producing semiconductors. In the same way, parents stay at home, mothers stay at home, children stay at home too. So they started buying electronics, all types of devices, competing with automobile manufacturers. So therefore, there was really a shortage of semiconductors. Not only that, vaccines to be delivered use vials, also made using silicon. So therefore, there was really a competition there for this resource called silicon. That created a challenge for these companies. Then, a technology race ensued. So then, we saw that companies and countries around the world said, maybe we need to be better prepared. And that actually was a wake-up call. Companies like Samsung, TSMC, for example, they are investing hundreds of billions of dollars in building, expanding production of semiconductors all over, in Europe, in Japan, and so on. Why? Because they realized they wouldn't like to be faced with the same problem again. Semiconductors are everywhere. So if we're not able to provide this oil to our people, we will run into another range of trouble. That's not what they are doing. Of course, we sometimes forget about Moore's law. Gordon Moore, he's a co-founder of Intel, more than 50 years ago, came out with this concept that every 18 months, we would be able to comprise the space that semiconductors components need in a chip. And that rule actually worked. For the last 50 years, every 18 months, companies were able to compress the space taken by these components. That actually led to the deployment of silicon semiconductors in many, many devices. However, now we have an issue. We cannot be in that process forever. At some moment, when you think about compressing these components, we get into the atom level. And at that level, the elements of nature don't work in the same way. If I drop this element on the floor, this element is going to follow Newtonian mechanics. That's no longer the case at the micro level. And that's a totally different game. So I wonder, the big investment that many of these companies are now implementing for semiconductors, will they still be valid in the new age when we're going to think about quantum computers? A few months ago, many places in the world were faced with dramatic rainfalls, flooding from China to Germany, from the US to India. Hundreds of people perished, unfortunately, due to these nature incidents. Climate change is happening. So how we are not able to predict the scale of these events, even though today supercomputers are predicting the weather? Because weather prediction is a very complicated task. It's not something that can be even managed exactly, precisely with supercomputers. That's where quantum computer enters into the picture. Because this type of prediction is so complicated, the number of variables changes so fast, that quantum computers become perfect for this task. And that is the message that I want to give you today. If you think about these review technologies and you think about what's where the future is going to go, I predict that quantum computer is going to be the most relevant technology in the next 10 years. And that's where most of the investment will have to be followed through. So if those investments in semiconductors today are worth Hopefully, this will be also leveraged in the next stage of development for quantum computers. Many companies around the world are working on these technologies in China, in America, in Europe. But still, we are far away from the end goal. If you think about the progression of quantum computers, we are probably in the 40s when you think about traditional computers. 
And if you remember well, in the 40s, 1940s, a computer would take all this space. When the computer was turned on, the lights in the city will flicker. And that's where we are today when you think about quantum computers. However, the benefits will be also very significant. So quantum computing becomes key because most of the victims of these incidents, rainfalls, flooding, happen to be the humblest people on earth. They are the ones who live on basements, who are working, who are going to work every day, who have to go to work. And that's not what we decide. This is what, not what we would like to see. We would like to see benefits for everybody. We would like to see technology impacting positively the lives of everybody. And I believe quantum computing is in the path to provide benefits, clear, tangible benefits for everybody in society. That's the message I want to give you today. Thank you very much.